It's plain to see We're showing the whole world What a country should be United we stand In America Hand in hand In America Together as one In a land that we love United we stand in America Good morning, welcome to Changing Times. It is Wednesday, September the 4th. What a beautiful day in Springfield, Missouri. We are live at Axe Media Group headquarters in Springfield, Missouri, and I am Lynn Morris and, and you I'm are Dr. Mary Byrne. Dr. Mary Byrne, and our co-host. We do. We we don't have any extra chairs today. And I tell you what, we have a great show lined up. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Cultural Impact Conference that's going to be going on this Saturday, September the 7th in Ozark, Missouri. It's at 1400 West Jackson. That's one of the main streets uh, going into Ozark off of Highway 65. And uh, I know a little bit about First Baptist Church because <coughs> Janet and I went there 37 years. So, so uh, we were members there, and we are actually still members of First Baptist Church in Ozark, Missouri. So uh, we're going to be talking, and, and Dr. Mary is going to be kind of leading our discussion about uh, what, what's going on, why we're doing it, uh, and things like that. We've got two great guests, and uh, we've got Steve Crowder. What one of the have? founders of the conference. Yeah, yeah you're the, one of the founders. That's, that's what Dr. Phil, uh, the pastor, said, <laughs> that you're one of the founders. Anything else? Uh, that, why, why, did you, why did you get started in this? Why, why did you want to accomplish His it? conscience bothered him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, um, it was actually about a year and a half ago, some men that I meet with on a, a regular basis uh, weekly on a Bible study had read Eric Metaxas' book, Letter to the American Church, and we were really convicted about how, um, especially how he compared the German church during Hitler's rise to where America is today, and how uh, a big portion of the church is silent. Hmm. And, you know, Bill Federer, who would be one of our speakers and is actually traveling around Missouri right now speaking, um, has written a book called Silence is Consent. And so we we had just felt convicted. We prayed about it, and um, a lot of us had worked with a mission called Project Hope that is in both Haiti and Nicaragua, which, you know, pretty peaceful countries. Oh, yeah, real peaceful right now. <laughs> Steve is an administrator in that project. And so... And so what we see in Nicaragua, and especially here recently, is they're trying to choke out Christianity. Mm -hmm. And just last week, they told us we would no longer be a not-for-profit in Nicaragua, that they would charge 15% on everything for our payroll and everything. And so we saw that as, okay, this is exactly where America could end up, and mm -hmm. it could be quickly mm -hmm. in an anti-Christian culture. And so um, we felt just really burdened to try to wake up the church in southwest Missouri to to speak to not only pastors but to church leaders of you need to be culturally engaged. Well, right. that's exactly right, and I appreciate you doing that, and you're a difference maker. I don't know if anybody's told you that or not, but here here at our show, we every, every week we have great guests, just like you guys, and, and uh, we have difference makers. Just and, average uh, people. Doing great things uh, yeah. for the Lord and great things for other people. And, and so we really appreciate that. And then we, we have Haven Howard. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I met Thank you, you for, for the first me. time, and you are with uh, Concerned, Women, for Concerned Women of America mm -hmm. down in the Branson area. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you do there? Causes trouble. Causes trouble. <laughs> For the devil. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure a lot of people think that. Um, we have a prayer chapter that meets once a month. Uh -huh. And so we try to educate people on what's going on, not just in the state and federal, but Taney County. And um, I tell you what, our chapter members have got very involved in uh, the State Republican Caucus. And um, even though Concerned Women for America doesn't take 
can't endorse candidates and things like that. We did we did stir up the people to get involved in yeah. local candidate things, and so I try to keep everyone informed on what's going on in the area. We've been to city council meetings when we were having major issues. We had a whole bunch of us go to city council meetings. So we just try to get people involved, get them aware, and get them involved. And that's that's our messaging here: is that civic engagement is an aspect of discipleship. Yes, this is not um, just a personal hobby. <laughs> This is something the founders said, if you're going to maintain your freedom, it's up to you to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, so much of the, the public school's purpose was to equip people to preserve their liberty. That's in our Constitution. To read the Bible. Yeah. But the, the point is, they, 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 it said in, in the Missouri Constitution that the legislature is authorized to provide... Uh, gratuitous instruction, free instruction to preserve the rights and liberties of the people. And um, that got hijacked, mm -hmm. sorry, but by business, um, <laughs> to become human resource development, uh, which is why you see this major decline in people's awareness of the grassroots responsibility to defend the country through educated civic engagement. We're not talking military engagement. We're talking educated civic engagement. And so it's been up to NGOs <laughs> like Concerned Women for America to pick up the slack where the public schools have been failing in the preservation of our country. So uh, that's how I got to, to meet you. Um, is because I, I was disturbed in my spirit about what can I do and who do I network with to get it done. And uh, so Concerned Women for America was available, and um, we've been basically collaborating, coordinating, and um, working together for about 10 years. Hey, you yeah. know what? Off and, and on. Guys, I tell you, the uh, one thing I think this conference is going to do Saturday is the importance of involvement in local, state, and federal. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, I'll vote every four years for the president. They don't vote local. Mm -hmm. They don't vote on anything local. They complain because of the presiding commissioner. I get, I get complaints. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you, you know, they, they don't get involved. But I think we're beginning to get an upswell of people, mm -hmm. and certainly and hopefully Christians, because we've had a, a small group of Christians voting, and I think several elections now, if we could just have more Christians vote, like-minded people, that uh, some of the outcomes would be different. Well, there's a, a maxim, which is absolutely true, all politics is local. All politics is local because even the candidates that make it to the national level, the federal level, are, are somehow first processed through a filtering system sure. that begins at your county committees. Sure. I remember David Barton saying, you, you need to interview your dog catcher and find out what he believes <laughs> because right. you never know. He may yeah. move up in That's the political right. system. And interestingly... <laughs> David Barton says, I have only one issue that I use as my gauge for discerning who I'm going to vote for, and that is whether they're pro-life, which leads us back to the conference. <laughs> yeah. So tell us more about that, because one of the focuses, if I, if I use my teacher language, one of the foci of, of the conference is Amendment 3, which is a threat to, they, they call it, constitutional freedom, but, but it's actually a threat to parent rights mm -hmm. and a threat to not just children who are pre-born, but after children are born. The kind of reproductive intervention that can be given to these children without parent knowledge or consent. So, so tell us more about that, and then Haven's going to pick up and give us more detail about Amendment 3. Yeah, I think... Um, as we started preparing for this conference over a year ago and the focus shifted as the ballot initiative came up um, on uh, Amendment 3 was to educate churches. I mean, 99% of evangelical churches, according to Barna's studies, 
have no, have zero pro-life expression. So they, they don't talk about it. They don't, uh, definitely don't preach it from the pulpit. And so this, as Mary said, and I'm sure Haven will uh, talk about it, is there's 10 states that will have this as a, have abortion as a ballot initiative come November. And Missouri is just probably the most vague and most insidious um, one out there and will change so many different laws that are on the books. And I don't think people, first of all, whether you're pro-abortion or pro-life, it is a terrible piece of legislation. And to change your Missouri state constitution based on this, uh, first of all, it'll be in the the court system for years and years and years and years as people challenge every part of it, whether you're on one side or the other. So it should be, it should have never got this far, but we are where we are. And well, it, and the strategy for getting it on was outside money mm-hmm. coming yeah, in. I mean, plan- they know they can bypass the legislature mm-hmm. by, by funding ballot initiatives from a petition. Yeah, and I think the history is that um, what we... I think everybody sees this, but definitely evangelicals is they're so excited and everybody was jumping up and down when Roe v. Wade got overturned, but no one thought ahead and were aggressive and say, hey, this is going to impact, I mean, shoving it back to the states, because I don't think people really understood. I, I, I read a statistic that maybe one in 10 people can tell you what overturned Roe v. Wade really meant. And, and that was it. it. It got pushed back to the states. And so, as you said, state constitutions was an easy way to go around legislators and put this on a ballot through a ballot initiative. And Missouri, unfortunately, is one of the states that, that the chinning bar is 50 percent plus one to get a change to the Missouri Constitution. I mean, in Florida right now, they're dealing with it, and you've probably read about that, but their they're chinning bar is 60%. Yes, that's right. Our, our requirement for petition initiative is very, very low, which makes Missouri a target for that out-of-state money. Anything they want to do that would not pass through the filter of the legislators elected by the people they simply buy um, signatures in the two largest populated areas of the state uh, and uh, get it on the ballot. So we are, you might, we're just an easy target. Well, and I think that into your question about, you know, the conferences to educate people that are there, I mean, it's twofold. One is to educate people on Amendment 3, and we, and we have some really great speakers and a panel of people that are active uh, in that, but also to just wake up the church to say, you need to be talking about these these issues. And I was happy to see, you know, a pastor at one of the largest churches, and actually probably the largest church in Springfield, talk about it on Sunday, you know, and said, you need to vote no on this amendment. So hopefully other pastors will wake up and say, yeah, we ought to be talking about this. Yeah, regardless of what you think of the Johnson Amendment and its its threat to the uh, non-tax status of churches, I'll, I'll say two things on that. One, they can talk about the issues. That's not that's not uh, you might say restricted by that piece of legislation. Two, that piece of of legislation, the Johnson Amendment, is unconstitutional because it violates free speech. They the dem. Lem, the Marxists, who don't want that to go to court, really don't contest it. There's, there's a, actually a Sunday every year where um, a legal firm that um, supports free speech actually asks pastors, talk about it. Talk about candidates because we want them to sue us. <laughs> Because they'll lose. Right, right. <laughs> and so it's one of the things they don't want to be brought uh, to court. And, and my whole point is this is a paper tiger. This is a paper tiger in this country, not in Nicaragua, because they don't have a First Amendment like we do. Um, and so that's what makes the United States and our wonderful Constitution and Bill of Rights um, one of the, the models for the world for freedom is that we have in writing these rights, which, you know, 
half of the writers of the Constitution were trained in seminary. <laughs> they, right. were, they were using a biblical worldview to say this right. is what God expects. So uh, our, I, this is what I admire you for, Steve. Your motivation to provide a forum for pastors to hear the truth so that they overcome this fear and take on courage uh, to defend the word of God and defend the creation of God. That's who these unborn children are. Yeah. They are the creation of God. And, um, and the born children who are getting sliced up, I'm sorry, I'm very graphic about this, but this whole transgender thing is, is a big psyops operation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you, psychologically manipulating a child in, into confusion is heinous. It's heinous. Right. And then for, and, and in both of these heinous acts against young people, you have the medical profession being the, the science cover for um, really what is a destructive practice. So um, that's, that's why if you listen to Washington, they keep saying follow the sciences because that's their cover, <laughs> is to say this is our credibility. Uh, when, in fact, the real science that they're suppressing says this is very destructive for mind and body. Right. Yeah. yeah. But um, so s go ahead, Steve. What else is in your notes? Well, well I just I kind of the leap off of one thing you were saying there is that, you know, one of the defenses of that pastors or excuses that they give for not speaking about it is, well, that's political. Yeah. Uh -huh. And. You know they they don't understand. I mean, the left um, actually the liberals have hijacked the language and called everything that's a biblical principle. Well, that's you can't talk about that. That's political, and so people would get all scared about it. And it's like, no, this is your responsibility to preach the whole gospel, and you need to teach people to be civically involved. Yeah, and in discipleship, civic engagement becomes an act of showing love for your neighbor because you're kind of like the abolitionists against slavery. You have to act through the institutions of government to, to be the voice of, of freedom. We're not just talking reason. Sometimes you have to be unreasonable in how you continue to be on the offensive. You can't always be defensive. You have to go on the offensive to say this is wrong. And, um, yeah, so this is another kind of slavery? No, it, it is. And if you take that position, to your point, we would have never, we would still have slavery. That's right. We wouldn't have civil rights. If there I mean, the church engagement. led out in these issues, and now it's like, no, you can't talk about those yeah. anymore. And so there's pastors that are fearful, whether it's to lose their 501c, which we know is not an issue, or they're just fearful of losing church members. But, you know, they need to be bold and courageous. Yeah. And so the conferences hopefully mobilize, as you were saying, Lynn, the church to say, you guys need to step up in this time, at this time. Yeah, the cultural engagement begins from the pulpit. Right. Instructing the congregation on what it means to be a disciple and salt and light in the community, <clears throat> because that's what the Johnson Amendment did. It, yeah. it formalized religion within four walls, and that's not scriptural. Right. Yeah, so kudos to you. Well, to God, I, yeah, he's I opened know the you're doors, listening, but, though. And I don't know if it was Bill Fetter, it may have been Jack Hibbs, but he said exactly what you said is, so goes the pulpit. Uh, you know, the, the congregation follows the pulpit, That's right, and the community follows the congregation. So you influence that. That's and right. so if you have a strong pastor that's standing up for biblical principles and, and engagement with the culture... And, and not that you don't want to just preach the gospel, because that's, that does change people's lives. Well, hearts. there is personal salvation messaging yes. in the, I mean, the, yes. you know, but that's not the only messaging. Right. Right. And that's where, that's where it's safe to focus. Yeah. Um, but God is not a safe God. <laughs> he's, he's, he is not a tame lion, as C.S. Lewis would say. He is not a tame lion. So, um, which leads us in a segue to cultural influence and people who 
who are in the congregation listening and saying, yes, yes let's go. go, and that would be you, Haven Howard. <laughs> Well, one time our pastor said he thought I was the most political person in their congregation, and I'm thinking, out of a thousand people, I'm the most political. That's, <laughs> that's not saying very much, actually. <laughs> we should have more people involved. <laughs> but um, before I get into Amendment 3, um, I want to encourage everyone to check out Samuel Green. He has a website, reasonforlife.org. Reason for Life, and he actually has an article here, Pastors and the Moral Issue of Our Age, which is just what you were just talking about. Um, he said, if you were a pastor during slavery, would you have preached against it? Would you have spoken out? Well, this is the same thing. Um, and then he also, on his website, has a sample sermon for pastors to take and use it or take part of it. And it's treating um, abortion through a compassionate way, you know, but also sharing how pastors can share the abortion issue with their congregation um, in, in a legal, legal way, I guess. Some of them are so afraid of that. But um, Samuel Green is his name. He's from California, and he has been in Missouri. He's spoken several different times here in Missouri. I think he did a pastor's meeting in Springfield a couple months ago. Um, but anyway, that's just one an aside thing is um, information for the pastors that we can get to them. But um, a little background, when Roe v. Wade was um, overturned, Missouri had a trigger law so that as soon as Roe v. Wade was overturned, abortion became illegal in Missouri. Now, we know that the abortion pill is still being shipped into Missouri, um, which is, can be very detrimental <coughs> and damaging to girls. But we did have that law, and so consequently, that's why these people started challenging it, because we had no abortions. We had no abortion clinics in Missouri. <coughs> and like... You said earlier, even if you are pro-abortion, this is a terrible, terrible um, amendment because of what it's going to do. First of all, there will be no parental consent. They will be able to do abortions on uh, young girls um, without the parents even knowing about it or even having consent. You can have abortion all the way up through nine months. And to the time the baby is born, when we were in Wichita, when we lived in Wichita, is when George Tiller was doing the late-term abortions, and people just had a hard time believing that this was actually happening. But um, the partial birth abortion, so yes, and it will be available here in Missouri. Um, the health and safety standards; they won't be able to come into the clinics and check for their safety and see if they're following medical guidelines as far as health and safety. Um, like I said, there will be no more pro-life laws. We won't have the parental consent laws. We won't have the ultrasound. We will not um, abortion. I mean, pregnancy clinics will have to refer to abortion. Right now, if a girl comes in and she's set on abortion, they just say, well, you'll have to just go somewhere else. But now they will have to give a referral. Um, this is a big one. Women will not be able to sue for malpractice. So if something goes wrong with the abortion, they will not be able to even um, sue the doctor or the clinic. Um, ultrasounds, ultrasounds has been a big thing in the pro-life movement because we know that when that girl sees that baby in her womb, she's less likely to abort it because she realizes it is a human being. It is a real person. But now they will not be required to do that anymore. And then, of course, um, it'll be taxpayer-funded abortion, so... Even if you are for abortion, but you don't think that the government should pay for it, we will be paying for them. And there's a little more involved in that. But um, And then, of course, the fact that we're killing our population. Um, I remember Bernard Nathanson, who was the first abortionist in New York and fought to get abortion legalized and later, later totally changed his view. He said, this is not a religious issue. It's a human issue. We are destroying our progeny. We're destroying our children, our population. And I think we need to look at it that way also. Um, it, we know it is, a, for us, it is a biblical issue, but it is even more than that. It is destroying our, our children and our grandchildren. So um, do you have anything else you want to add to that, Mary? <clears throat> yeah, that this is not just a personal issue. Is that if you if you are a believer, that uh, when I one of my favorite scriptures actually comes from the book of Exodus. One of my favorite scriptures on this subject, 
which I think demonstrates God's view of what it means to be committing infanticide. Now, I'm not saying that women don't get themselves into situations where they're scared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do. My problem is with people who manipulate that fear to for their own benefit. And, mm -hmm. and I think what is just egregious to me, especially in these late-term abortions, is that the more formed the organs of the unborn child, the more valuable they are if in the sale mm -hmm, mm -hmm. after these abortions. And, and they're not telling women, well, actually, this is one of my marketing plans, <laughs> right. you know, for profit. They don't say that. They, they manipulate the women on, we can remedy your problem. We can alleviate your fears and concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the thing about Margaret Sanger, if, if people actually knew. And Seth Gruber is going to be talking about this in the 1916 Project. If they actually knew that Margaret Sanger practiced free love in, with the likes of H.G. Wells mm -hmm. and, and other high, you know, highly respected intellectuals in England. That's who she was hobnobbing with. And she was bringing their ideas of, of birth control and uh, for, so you could practice free love, bringing those ideas back here to America, funded by John D. Rockefeller, Jr., Mm -hmm. So th the whole thing was a plan of these elitists who were godless. And, and she said, I can't wait until we have real freedom here. And what mm -hmm. she meant was freedom from responsibility, um, which, you know, is not the noble ideals of how we treat each other according to God's word. So I wanted to, to read this section here so people would understand. This is not just a personal issue, this is something that sometimes you have to arrive at when you understand God's priorities. Even if it's not yours at this time, if you are a believer and want to follow God, read these scriptures. <clears throat> the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when you perform the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the stools, if it is a son, then you must kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she may live. However, the midwives feared God. Got it? <laughs> and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but kept the male children alive. The king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and preserved the male children's lives? The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew them very mighty. So it happened that because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And, and Pharaoh charged all his people saying, you know, well, he thought he was God. So he charged all the people saying, you must cast every son that is born into the river, and you must preserve every daughter's life. So the water imagery there is very important because the retaliation, the vengeance God will have to protect his people comes in the middle of Exodus where he says, The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians. Got it? Mm -hmm. So they're throwing babies into the river. God's going are, to take gonna, their lives yeah. by throwing them into the Red Sea. Yeah, that's good. So these are the days of Haman. This is where it, it may take time. You might not get the connection because there's a space mm -hmm. between what what the pharaohs thought was within their right to command the people. And what God said is, I'm sorry, they're my people. Mm -hmm. All right? So we're going to turn around onto you what you did to us. Um, that's, it's important to know that this is not our will. God loves his creation. Right. And children are part of that creation. 
it is more noble, more within his, his worldview to assist people who get themselves into um, vulnerable situations. Uh, but the death culture is not the answer. And, and Margaret Sanger, although she said she never um, was pro-abortion, she was pro-birth control, um, one thing led to another. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was the problem. And, and the, her whole point is you can have all of these sex acts outside of marriage. So this was actually a marriage issue. Mm -hmm. And um, she was very um, active in that manner, you might say. Yeah. Well, I remember um, I met a, a, a young black gal at one of our meetings, and she grew up in Wichita in the 60s, where the Black Panthers were becoming very famous. And, she, and the approach that Margaret Sanger and them had was, well, all the white girls can get abortions. You should be able to get them, too. This is an equality issue, yes. Yes. You know, that's a discrimination issue. And then they would put the abortion clinics in the black neighborhoods where it was easy for the girls to get there. So it was, you know, a, a terrible... It was actually to wipe racist. out the black. Yes, it was racist to wipe out the black community. And you can see in her writing that she, it was about population control, of poor, feeble, and and black. Yeah. But that was that was what the Fabian, the British Fabian Society was all about. Was creating a you know a dystopian really, but in their mind utopian society by eliminating the vulnerable, and having only the healthy. You know, and uh, intellectually, and that's what Hitler did too. And that's what Hitler did too. <laughs> exactly the same. Thing. Exactly right. And as a matter of fact, they were in communication. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you're right. Seth Gruber, who will be here Saturday, will have a great history on the whole Planned Parenthood and the eugenics. I mean, mm -hmm. she yes. was in the, she was into eugenics, and she wanted to control the black population. And as you said, Haven, the Planned Parenthoods are in black communities, and so that hasn't changed. Planned Parenthood still preys on the most vulnerable mm -hmm. and women of color. And so to your point of population control, they're the biggest impacted by that. And I think people just completely ignore that and don't want to hear that, but it's like this is a discrimination. This is a racist. This is, this is current eugenics. Right, and, and, but what, what goes along with that that we can't ignore is that in this free love value of that group, that intellectual group, the uh, marriage rate, or the, you might say, marriage status mm -hmm. of the black teens mm -hmm. um, who become vulnerable and, and susceptible to this, uh, the, this single head of household is very high. Right. But again... Whether or not they know it, they're being taught that you don't have to be married. Right. And, and in fact, biologically, you don't. There's the proof. Yeah. But if you're going to preserve the, the good plan God has for your life, right. to be involved in a mutually supporting, loving relationship that puts God at the center... Marriage is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the destruction of that with a free love value um, is hurtful. Well, it's it hurtful is. hurtful to the hearts of these young people. It, and, you know, statistics bear that out. Crime, I mean, drug use, everything relates back to a one, you know, parent household. And so when you look at the statistics, it's like, well, this is kind of how you fix this. Yeah, yeah. And so, it's in the book. Yes, it's in yes, the book. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I think one of the things that we need to really talk about is how to get Christians out to vote. Yes. Um, only one in three Christians actually go vote. And in, during our primary in Taney County, where I'm from, only 28% of the people voted. In Stone County, it was a little bit better. It was 30%. I don't know what it was in Green County or Christian County. Um, but I think one of the things this broadcast we're doing right now is encouraging people to get the literature, get, get out, talk to your neighbors, talk to your pastor, talk to your Sunday school classes, your Bible studies, help people understand the importance 
a voting no on this amendment and what, what it will do to our society. And the local debates, the local opportunities to, to visit with candidates is not televised. You have to get yourself out of the house. Yeah. You have to find out when mm -hmm. these events are, are happening. Um, is it an effort? Yes. <laughs> yes. But that is part of what it takes to keep your freedom. And that's why every individual has an obligation to protect their own freedom. Yeah. It's not going to be, it's, it's not the branches of the military. It's not who, just who you elect. You have to elect the people who are, who, um, are going to preserve a good community that's healthy to grow up in. And you have to learn who those candidates are. And again, it's not televised. Right. I had to learn that. My gosh, I was in my 50s before I figured that out. I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> older than 50 now. Oh, we yeah. know you're older than 50. Yeah, and making up for lost time. That's how I look at it. Hey, guys, we need to talk about our sponsors. And, and um, we've got two great sponsors. Uh, Brad Pisto is a cer certified fiduciary financial planner right in Ozark, Missouri, on Farmer Road. And uh, he he uh, was on our show what he I think about three two, weeks two or three, two, weeks, two or three ago. weeks ago. Former pastor. And, uh, he is a tremendous man, one of the best financial planners for retirement in the country, not just Missouri. Licensed in 16 states and has associates in all 50 states. He can help you, and you know I use him. Uh, Don Blackard uses him. A lot of my family, a lot of friends, uh, people use him. Uh, you'll never run out of money before you run out of life is one of the main features of the programs that uh, that he does. And, and so Brad is uh, absolutely a great guy. If you'll call 417-581-9222, 417-581-9222, Lisa will answer the phone, and you will get a book sent to you. You can get Safe Money Matters, his first number one best-selling book on financial retirement, um, and uh, that's on Amazon. Or you can get the second book, Bulletproof, uh, which is a continuation of the, some of the same things plus some new things that uh, Brad is doing. So uh, highly recommend Brad Pistow. It's never too early to think about retiring. And so uh, really a great thing. And one of the great things that he did, and I was talking to Jim Whining, our CEO of Axe Ministry. Uh, I didn't know this either, but I actually had this done for me by Brad. Uh, you can refinance annuities. So some of the investments that I have through Brad Pistow are annuities. I've heard some people say they don't like annuities. Well, let me tell you what, I've made thousands thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars with annuities and he just refinanced one of my annuities that I had for I don't know probably eight or nine years now and and I made about 35,000 off of the refinancing of it and I got a higher interest rate and I got a bonus for doing it and things like this and so I made money overnight because of him refinancing. So if you've got old annuities out there, you may be stuck at an older interest rate. And interest rates are getting higher right now on paying off on CDs and all types of investments. So that's something you want to do. Our second uh, sponsor is John Whitaker. That's Springfield Nissan, Springfield Kia, located on South Campbell in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, 3838 South Campbell. On one side, they have new cars, those ni Nissans and Kias. On the other side of South Campbell, across the street, they have used cars. They have a lot of certified cars. And we have, uh, on September 17th, Mary, we will have either uh, John Whitaker or we will have a general manager, and, and his name is Alan Swanson. Um, and one of those gentlemen are going to be here talking all about cars. When's the best time to buy a car? 
Do you buy a new car? Do you buy a used car? Do you buy? Do you lease a car? You know, there's all kinds of questions, and cars are such an expensive investment today. You need to have the best advice you can get. Do you buy? Do you buy electric car? Do you buy a hybrid? Do you buy? Do you continue to buy gas? I mean, so there's all kinds of questions about automobiles, and these guys are going to be able to tell you about that. So, so, thirty-eight, thirty-eight South Campbell, eight eight two. 3838, 882-3838, 417-882-3838. Call them today. There's another lady, her name's Susan, that always answers the phone. Absolutely perfect customer service. So that's what you get when you call Springfield Nissan, Springfield Kia. So that's our sponsors. And you know, guys, we are live. And, and one of the things that's interesting today, we're talking about Missouri. We have people from all 49 other states watching our show today. We also have other people from other countries watching our show today. And uh, uh, this is truly amazing. I think the thing that you need, and we, Steve, I want to know before we run out of time, we're going to run out of time here pretty quick, but I want to make sure that we give some of the speakers what time it starts and things like that, some really important details. But, but I just want people to know one of the points that we've got, we've got so many important issues in this country. And you may not have Amendment 3 abortion like we do in Missouri. You may have something else in another state. You have got to get engaged. Yes. And churches, you've got to get engaged. You've got to get involved. And the pastors, you're the leaders. And people come every Wednesday night or Sunday or whenever they come to the church and they are depending on you to tell them and inform them and educate them and get them motivated. And it is legal to do that. And so every state, be involved. We've got important elections coming up in November. Steve, what are the other states that you can think of? You mentioned that there were 10 total who had these petition initiatives. Yeah, don't. I, <laughs> you know, I know Arizona uh -huh. and... Uh, Illinois, New York, Missouri, um, Colorado, I think. Colorado, um, Florida. Yeah, Florida. So, uh, so this is. is a national issue. Well, yeah. there's, right. yeah, I mean, it, it. Unfortunately, there's 27 that pretty much have institutionalized abortion. This, if all 10 of these pass, that would be 37 states in the United States hmm. that would have some form of legalized abortion. Yeah. So it is not um, it is not a good thing. So, and to answer your question, on Saturday, uh, the doors open at eight o'clock, and um, we uh, will start the uh, program at nine o'clock. Uh, Senator Josh Hawley will be one of the first speakers. Uh, he's he thinks this issue is so important that he made some changes to his schedule to be here in Springfield, Missouri, because he's up for re-election. And the Senate uh, session starts on Monday, so he has to be back in Washington, D.C., so he's kind of carved out uh, Saturday to be with us. And then William Federer, um, noted historian, which has, he's from Missouri, uh, ran for Congress in Missouri, and so he, he will be here. And then we'll have Seth Gruber, who is... Uh, has the white rose resistance which is you need to go to his website and see the story behind that i we could take a whole hour talking about that but he'll be here and he's a real uh pro-life activist and then we will have a panel to discuss the uh amendment three to educate people uh, much like what haven did here uh we have three panelists um, lisa mcintyre from the Pregnancy Resource Center in Springfield, and Jody Wilhelm from uh, Jody Grace Ministries, and she's very active in, in Jeff City, and Kathy Fork, who's uh, 40 Days of Life. And so they will um, explain that, and then Tony Perkins uh, will be our final speaker and uh, from, um, I mean, Washington. you know, yeah, from Washington. Yeah. And so everybody knows, yeah, uh, the Family Research Council. Uh, from Tony Perkins, and what people don't understand, maybe they know, but he was a representative in Louisiana and was very pro-life uh, when he was there. And then Jason Rappert uh, from Arkansas, who heads up the National Association of Christian Lawmakers, and he was a state senator in Arkansas, was actually the first senator in a state 
uh, to put forth an amendment for um, the heartbeat law. And so I uh, got a great lineup of speakers and uh, I know my wife had already told me something, uh, you know, William Frederick, I've got seven of his books uh, at different conferences I've gone to. I've bought a book or two every time. I mm-hmm. love books. Mm-hmm. I like to read. And But my wife, we downsized from a larger home to a home half the size. And my wife reminded me just yesterday as we were talking about this, she said, you can't buy any more books. We don't have for, for any more books. Well, that's what so. Conservative America's Club is going to do at its table. It's going to offer books at cost oh. so that people who are moved by what the speakers say about you know, yeah. Christians needing to have civic engagement, books that you could take back to your churches, back to your yeah. um, That'd be great. Uh, Sunday school ministries and so on, it'll be ready for you to, to use as material to... Um, Encourage civic engagement. And by the way, Eric Metaxas has on his website the DVD for Letters to the American Church, a study guide, and the book mm. that you can buy as a set. It's awesome. Yeah. And I think they're having lunch there, lunch boxes or something like that. You yeah, we'll have uh, Chick fil A. Uh, go to the website, which is CI for Cultural Impact Conference. Uh, dot com no, and dot org dot org I'm sorry I thank you Mary yeah. um, ciconference.org and you'll be able to register there and also reserve a box lunch uh, there which would be very helpful and then uh, the last is that we will be streaming live uh, the conference and we will uh, use our Facebook which is the cultural impact Facebook page as the platform so those things. And I think your wife would be happy if you got rid of one book and then bought a new one. <laughs> well, I tell you, but we've probably get, gotten rid of hundreds of books. We, we take them to the library and other places and give those books away. But but uh, honestly, uh, I may still buy another book. You, know, you, never, you, you never know. Are we running out of time, Mr. Producer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think we are out of time. But uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you, guys. Mm-hmm. You're a difference maker, too. I didn't say that <laughs> to begin with, but all hosts, all the guests are, are difference makers. And this is going to be a great event Saturday in Ozark, Missouri, the Cultural um, Impact Conference. Free. Uh, free. free. It's free. free. Somebody free. asked the other day, how much does it cost? <laughs> a lot of these places, places charge for meetings and things like that. There is no charge. Um, just please come and and you know what if they can't stay the whole day just come and stay as long as you can learn what you can learn and and it will make a difference not only in your life but a lot of other people's lives so we'll be back uh, next Wednesday and we'll see you then The United States of America